Korea. Peace, Bolati, Daspata, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal of Mercy on us, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal of Mercy on us, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal of Mercy on us, Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. O Holy Trinity, of mercy on us, Lord, be gracious unto our sins. Master, pardon our iniquities, Holy One, visit and heal our infirmities for thy name's sake. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit both now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The offspring of Celebria. I don't know. The offspring of Celebria and the guardian of Aegina. The true friend of virtue who disappeared in the last years. O Nectarius, we faithful honor thee as the godly servant of Christ. For thou pourest forth healings of every kind for those who piously cry out, Glory to Christ who hath glorified thee. Glory to him who hath made thee wondrous. Glory to him who worketh me for all through thee. Holy Master, bless. Tonight, uh, I just want to say, not much because that subject could last forever practically, but I want to talk to you a little bit about the holy matters of what we can call the papal yoke. The new calendarist ecumenists avoid this subject totally. They don't commemorate the saints of these years. They when they do mention it, they try to whitewash it and cover it up, and make excuses, and, and say, try to avoid uh, focusing on the tragedy that really existed. And at some times, they'll even claim that these events never happened and these saints never existed. To understand a little bit, we have to look at the history of what led up to this Latin yoke. <coughs> The last Orthodox Pope of Rome resigned in the year 1009. This is also the last year that the Pope's name is commemorated in the Orthodox churches. Up until that time, the Popes were Roman and elected by the faithful of Rome. The papacy of Rome had collapsed morally and they were being replaced by candidates chosen by the German Emperor of the Holy, Holy Roman Empire. And the heresy of the Filioque, which was really a German heresy, a Frankish heresy, was officially introduced into the Church of Rome in the year 1014. Up until then, the Roman Church refused to accept this heresy. This change in popes from the Roman to the, to the German, brought a great turmoil to the papacy. And in 1046, there were three different popes at the same time. The German King Henry III went down to Rome, expelled all three popes, and placed his own pope in charge of the papacy. This pope died in less than a year. Henry then put in another pope who lived only 23 days. They were probably both poisoned by the Roman resistance against the Germans. Eventually, though, the Germans won the papacy. The third pope that Henry placed was Pope Leo IX, who was a German aristocrat who was able to consolidate his power by defeating his enemies in war. He even led his own army into battle against the Normans. 
And it was not at all unusual to see a pope dressed in armor leading a battle. And when he fought the Normans, he lost that battle and he was imprisoned for nine months. He was a prisoner of the Normans. It was very unusual. The Normans were Roman Catholic and very devout, and, but they had to imprison their own pope. And it was while he was in prison that Pope Leo sent his delegates to Constantinople to excommunicate the Patriarch. And this is known as the Great Schism. The Pope of Rome, from that moment on, began pressuring the Orthodox to accept him as leader of the Church and to accept also the filioque heresy and other innovations of, of, the, of, the, of papism. The Pope repeatedly sent bishops to the city of Constantinople with demands to persuade the Orthodox to unite with him and accept his heresies. The efforts of the Pope had no effect. The Orthodox remained steady in their face, faith, and so the Pope decided to destroy the Orthodox by creating crusades. Now the crusades are an infamous part of European history. <coughs> Unfortunately, history has been whitewashed so much that the word crusade has entered the dictionary as a noble endeavor. The crusaders who were knights are seen today and in most media as valiant men, whereas in truth they were barbaric uh, murderers and, and marauders. And today, you often see the term a knight in shining armor, when you want to talk about somebody who's really, really noble. Whereas in fact, they were anything but noble. Uh, they were barbaric uh, murderers. There were, all in all, nine crusades. By the fourth crusade, the Europeans had seen the wealth of the Eastern Roman Empire and were anxious to get their hands on it. And this is why the Pope directed the Fourth Crusade in the year 1204 to conquer Constantinople. And on April the 13th, 1204, the Crusaders actually entered Constantinople. They knew Constantinople, they knew its riches, and it was a very, very rich city, and most Crusaders lived in huts in their own place. And the poorest neighborhood in Constantinople was far more luxurious than where the majority of the, uh, the Crusaders lived. And so once the Crusaders entered the city, they invaded everyone's homes in search of valuables because that was the way the Crusaders, the Crusaders worked back then. They were allowed, after capturing the city, they were allowed three days of looting and, and doing whatever they want to. On the first day alone, they killed 2,000 people and looted their homes. We don't know the number of those killed in the following days. They rushed into the, all the churches, and especially St. Sophia, which they looted and desecrated. They supposedly killed Christians. They spilled the Holy Communion on the ground and broke up the chalices to seize the precious stones in them, on them. Others, chalices, they just stole them to take back home with them to use as part of their kitchenware. And in order to load, load what they were stealing, that's how much they were stealing, they brought in wagons pulled by mules into the Church of St. Sophia. The animals slid on the floor, the stone floor, and the crusaders were jabbing them with their spears to make them move. And so the floor of Saint Sophia was covered with blood and feces. And then the crusaders themselves were just as bad as the animals. And they were also using the church as a latrine. Back then the crusader army would travel along, uh, would happen with it, att attached to it, a battalion of women prostitutes. And they brought, in one case, in this case, they brought a prostitute in, put her on the holy table of St. Sophia, and had her dance and sing uh, lewd songs. 
This is the beginning of what we can call the Latin yoke on the Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox countries. Not only the Eastern Orthodox countries, but in many countries. We can't go into it tonight, but the, the Crusaders, and if you're interested, you can see Father David, he can tell you a little bit more about this. The first Crusades were against the English, and, and when they destroyed the Church of England, against the Southern Italians, where they destroyed, destroyed the Orthodox Church in Southern Italy, which up until that time was what, a bright church, and not to mention Poland, Ukraine, and the problems and the political fighting that we see today is carry on of this movement which eventually became called the Union Movement. And we can't go into that right now, it's just too much. After the fall of Constantinople by the Crusaders, as we said in the year 1204, and the, 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 most of Greece and the, and the Middle East was divided up among different powers, Cyprus, Jerusalem, Antioch, feudal kingdoms were set up in all these places. And the feudal system of government was brought in under the direction of the papal clergy who oppressed the Orthodox because they saw them as schismatics and heretics. And they were trying to force them all to return to papal jurisdiction. A papal patriarch was installed in Constantinople, just like there was a papal patriarch installed in Jerusalem and in Antioch. And papal bishops were expelled from all these countries. I mean, the Orthodox bishops were expelled from all these countries and papal bishops took their positions. This policy, however, failed to, ch to change the faith of the majority of the people. They remained Orthodox in spite of all this persecution. There were no Orthodox bishops to be found in these churches, or actually very, very few. I think Cyprus had just four. Most of the bishops were driven out of Greece. The whole synod of Jerusalem was driven out, so there were no bishops in Jerusalem. And so the Orthodox had to come up with a system where the ch their churches were administered by uh, committees of priests. Which, who were called in Greek protopapades. And they were the administrators in, 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 in lieu of the fact that there was no bishop. And whenever they needed a new priest, they would have to find some bishop in some country where they could send the priest to be ordained. And even then, the, the popes, the people, uh, had a limit on how many clergy uh, could be uh, in, in, the, in, in, a, in a given area. So they, these protopapades are the ones who administered the e internal affairs of the Orthodox churches. The fall of Constantinople to the Crusaders in 2004 marked the beginning of occupation of most of Greece, the, Pel the Pel Peloponnese Peninsula of Greece. The greater part of the Peloponnese had been granted to Venice and other parts of Greece to various uh, European powers. Papal priests were given large territories, financial privileges, and judicial powers. They ran the courts. The Crusaders built fortified castles throughout this empire. This is probably the most famous Crusader castle today in Greece, uh, next to the castle, uh, sorry if I look, in Rhodes, which I don't know how many of you have visited Rhodes to see the castle there that was uh, built by the Knights Templar. In Rhodes, the castle is on the, what are known as the Street of the Knights. See, the, the, the Greeks today, they use all this for, to attract tourists. And they call it the Street of the Knights, and they go along with the myth that a knight was something noble. Well, there's nothing noble about these knights. They're all gangsters, murderers, rogues. And yet, it makes money to have a street called the Street of the Knights. And then at the end of the street is the Palace of the Grand Masters. There's a massive stronghold which had three circuits of walls around it. And it was in the highest point of Rhodes. It was constructed by the Knights Hospitaller. That this is a monastic brotherhood of knights that also practice, practice black magic. Modern day masons 
adopted many of their secret rituals and beliefs. I remember growing up as a kid, we knew about Masons, and there was an order of Masons for young kids, and it was called the De Molay. Well, Jack De Molay was one of their martyrs, of, of, of these Knights Templars. So you can see the direct connection in many ways uh, between the Masons and these, uh, m these knights who were monks, gangsters, murderers, and magicians who practiced black magic. It should be noted that the Franks who had been in various parts of Greece and the Middle East for many centuries fought a great struggle to subdue the Orthodox Christians to the papal bishops. This was enforced until, believe it or not, World War II in the Dodecanes under Italy, Italy. And we were talking with Father Luke the other day, who told me that his father, Father Xenophon, blessed memory, was a victim of this because Father Xenophon was born under this regime and there were no Orthodox bishops allowed on roads. And he was forced to leave Rhodes because they were going to draft him into the Italian army and World War II was approaching, so he left. And then they went back and that's where Father Luke, I think, was born in Rhodes. Mm -hmm. But by then, uh, World War II had ended and the Italians were forced uh, to, to, uh, to leave uh, Rhodes. But up until World War II, this condition existed in many parts of Greece. Uh, Rhodes, the Greek was not allowed to be taught in the school. If the children needed to learn Greek, they would go to the church to be taught by the priests. There were no bishops, but there were priests. And this was the system that was set up by, by the Pope uh, at the very, very beginning of the Crusades. The worst, let, let's turn now because it's just too much to talk about what went on in Greece. The Empire of Constantinople managed to recover under difficult conditions in 1261. They, they were able to push out the, the, the Latins from Constantinople, but Constantinople was left very vulnerable and eventually fell to the Turks. Uh, the papists were expelled from many parts of Greece and your, uh, the empire, but it, they still they occupied a great part. Sadly, because they were weak, the Greek Emperor of Constantinople, Michael Palaiologos, in 1274, accepted the Pope's terms to be united to the Pope and actually attended the Papal Synod, the Council of Lyon, which is a, for the Roman Catholics is an ecumenical council. And there, uh, the Emperor uh, accepted uh, submission to the Pope in full unity with, with the Roman Catholic Church. They dethroned the Orthodox Patriarch from in Constantinople and set up one who was subject to the Pope, a, a, a patriarch known as John Beckus. And between the emperor and, and the patriarch, a persecution started uh, against the Orthodox. First, let's take a look. Here's an icon of the fathers of the Holy Monastery of Zografo. There's a lot to say about the Crusades, in it, but we don't have time. The fathers of Mount Athos at that time were a bright light that illumined the whole Orthodox world. The papists knew that and they wanted these fathers not to be an obstacle to their subjugation of, to the Pope. So they sent soldiers to Mount Athos to force the monks of Mount Athos, the fathers, to accept the union that was proclaimed at the Council of Lyon. At that time, there was a holy monk who lived on Mount Athos near the monastery of Zografo, because on Mount Athos, I don't know how many of you have been there, there are the major monasteries, but many of the fathers live in Kelia and in, in Skeets, uh, in small groups or sometimes even by themselves. And there was a holy monk, a holy father near Zografo, who had as a rule every day to read the Akathis to the Mother of God in front of her icon. One day, while the elder was chanting, Hail, O Bride Unwedded, he heard from the icon, Hail to you, Elder of God. The elder was frightened. Then he heard, Do not be afraid, but go quickly to the monastery and tell the abbot and monks that my enemies 
and my son's enemies are approaching. Whoever is weak in soul, let him hide until the temptation is over. But those who wish to receive crowns of martyrdom should remain in the monastery. Go quickly. And the elder, right away, obedient to the voice of the Theotokos, went to the monastery. As soon as he arrived at the gate of the monastery, he was amazed to see his icon of the Theotokos waiting for him at the gate. He knelt down, venerated the icon, picked it up, and with the icon in his hands, went to see the abbot of the monastery. The monks, the fathers, were disturbed by what they had heard. Some ran, as the Theotokos told them, and hid in the mountains and in the caves. But 26 fathers, including the abbot, St. Thomas, stayed in the monastery. They didn't run away. They climbed up to the tower and waited for the martyrs' wreaths. They waited for their, for their martyrdom. In a short while, the papists arrived. At first, they used all their rhetorical power to try and persuade the Holy Fathers to open the gates and to accept the Pope as the head of the church and the papal innovations and heresies. The Fathers yelled out, Who told you that the Pope is the head of the church? The head of the church is Christ. We will not open the gates. We prefer to die rather than let you pollute this sacred monastery. The, pap the, the papist answered, If that is what you want, then you will die. And immediately they gathered wood and spread it all around the tower. They lit the fire and burnt all the fathers. The memory of the Zografu fathers is kept on September 22nd. Now we'll go to Caries. The Orthodox Church on December 5th, which is going to be this week, in addition to the memory of St. Savas, <laughs> we also read that day, celebrates the memory of the Holy Martyrs of Caries. Now, Caries is a settlement, it's not a monastery, on Mount Athos, where the clerical and secular administration of the Holy Mountain resides. The fathers of this area were guided by their spiritual father, who had the title Protos. Now, the Protos was a the, out of the representatives of all the monasteries, because they formed a council to, that administered Mount Athos, and that council resided in Caries. The head of the council was known as Protos, the first, Protos. The Protos uh, was, ele was elected by the fathers, and he was a spiritual leader. So they all, they, they all received uh, orders from the papers that they would come to a meeting in Caries. And so they all went, all the monks of the whole area around Caries, including the Protos. But the, this, this proposal was one for them to betray the faith and to accept the heresies of the Pope and to submit to the Pope. All the fathers with martyric boldness, led by the, by the Protos, spoke up and refused this, this offer. And right away, the papers began torturing them. As much, and, and as much as they were being tortured, <coughs> the more persistent they, be, they were in keeping the Orthodox faith and refusing to accept uh, papism. Then the command came that the torture was to end and that they were to die. They took the Protos and hung him, and the rest of the fathers were killed by sword. One who, historian who describes it said, says that the earth turned red from the blood. Next, we go, let's go to, to the monastery of Iviron. Iviron Monastery was a monastery where the bulk of the monks were from Georgia. That's why it's known, and the Greek, Greek uh, Georgia is known as Iberos. So they were Georgian monks who settled in that area from the beginning of the 10th century, and they were there together with the Greeks. And they labored and they formed this monastery of Iviron. The papal soldiers went there too to convince the fathers to accept the Pope and the heresies. And they refused the monks of Iviron. 
They gathered about 200, because the mon monasteries back then had many, many fathers. They gathered 200 elderly monks, elderly fathers. And with spears, they pushed him into a ship. They took it out into the sea, and they sunk it, and all the fathers drowned. They took the younger monks, the healthier ones, and deported them to Italy and sold them there as slaves. The, the martyrs of Iviron are commemorated on May the 13th. Now let's, let's go somewhere else besides Mount Athos. I want to talk, talk to you a little bit about St. Miletius Galesiotis, the confessor. St. Miletius was born in Pontus around 1209. You see, this is the era of, of the of the Crusaders. And as he grew older, he devoted himself to Christ and he became a monk at a young age. First, he went to the Holy Land and then when on his way there, he reached the Patolus River near the Aegean coast of Turkey and he found that river flooded and there was no way to cross it. So he began to pray. As soon as he had finished his prayer, he found himself all of a sudden picked up and brought onto the other side of the, of the bank of the river. And then he continued toward the Holy Land. And then after many hardships, he reached the Holy Land and worshiped all the holy sites. He then became a monk. He went on from the Holy Land, from Jerusalem to Mount Sinai and he became a novice there. And he was very, very vigorous as a novice, and all the fathers, the older fathers, noticed it and were awed by his ascetic labors. And he, know, and, and he became conscious of this, and he left so that his pride would not be uh, pumped up. And so he left at night, and this he did so that he wouldn't be overcome by pride. And he went back to Jerusalem. Then he decided to go to, back to, Saint, to Asia Minor to, uh, to the monastery of St. Lazarus on Mount Galatius. And there he took the name Miletius and became a great uh, schema monk. He took upon himself the, the akonima, the ministry of serving all the needs of the brotherhood all day long. He did everything. And all night long, he prayed. He didn't have a bed, no mattress, no blanket. What he would do sometimes when he was very tired, he would take a rope and tie himself to a column in his cell just to get a little sleep, tied, standing up to a column. And there were some weeks where he remained completely awake. All this, of course, done by the grace of God. In the early years of the papal rule, St. Melendrius did not remain in his monastery silent. When the faith was in danger, he went to the surrounding towns and cities to strengthen the faith of the people. He refused to recognize the official patriarch John Vecus, and he continued commemorating the defrocked patriarch St. Joseph of Constantinople, whose memory we keep on the 30th of October. When the emperor and the Patriarch John Becos began the persecution of the Orthodox. Saint Miletius, together with his co-struggler Saint Galactian, Galactian, appeared in front of the emperor and chastised him for his heresy and union with the Pope. The emperor then imprisoned them both, and after seeing that they remain uh, that they remain in the faith, he exiled them to Skiros. Saint Galatian remained in Skiros, while Saint Miletius was sent by the emperor to Rome to speak to the pope, where he would be judged by the pope. The pope impro imprisoned him for seven years. Then by order of the emperor, Saint Miletius was brought back to Skiros, <coughs> was still where Saint Galatian was still uh, imprisoned. After pressure, from the Patriarch and some other Unionist bishops. You see, the Patriarch and the bishops were more fanatic than the Emperor. They pressured him 
And the emperor gave in and ordered that if the Saint Galaction and Saint Meletius did not unite themselves to the Pope of Rome, they should be tortured and executed. And he sent a, royal, a ship to bring them back to Constantinople. And at, once they reached Constantinople, they appeared again in front of the emperor. He pressured them again to accept the union. The saints refused. And the, uh, the emperor ordered them to be ruthlessly beaten for hours. After this horrible torture of being beaten, the confessors fell to the ground as if they were dead. Then they recovered and they were taken back to prison. Then St. Meletius was ordered to be hanged on a dry tree. But as soon as the body, which was swinging on the tree, as soon as the body of the saint swinging back and forth would touch, bang against the dry tree, the tree turned green and flowers started blossoming and leaves coming out. When the emperor heard this miracle, he tried again to persuade the saints to join him, but again they refused. Again, they were locked up in prison. Then he sent soldiers to pull out the eyes of Saint Galaction so that he could not perform a divine liturgy. And they were also ordered to pull out the tongue of Saint Meletius so that he would stop talking against the Pope. Through the grace of God, Saint Galaction, even though he didn't have eyes, continued serving the divine liturgy. And Saint Meletius, even though he had no tongue, was still able to teach the faith. Shortly afterwards, Emperor Michael died and, and Andronicus was the new emperor. He ascended the throne. He, be, he was against the union. He released the Orthodox from their prisons. Three years later, after re being released from prison, St. Meletius reposed in peace, but he left behind a very valuable treasure in seven, seven different volumes which he had written. Their holy memory is celebrated on January the 19th. Now let's go further up in history to 1715. The Venetian Empire was coming to an end. <coughs> the Turks conquered the Peloponnese and then attempted to conquer the Ionian Islands. And I might, I'm just going to diverge. The Greeks and the Christians in all of Asia Minor, Jerusalem, welcomed the Turks in many times because they preferred being under the Muslims than under the, 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 the Pope. And I'll give you a quote later on from St. Neophytus of Cyprus about how he, how he expressed it. So the Turks attacked Kerkira, which is probably the most significant island of all the, the islands there. And on June the 14th, 24th, and 1716, the Turkish army and navy surrounded the city by land and by sea and were attacking. The battle lasted for, for 50 days. While the men fought, the women, children, and old people gathered in the church of St. Spiridon, where his relics are up until today, and were praying. The Turks decided to put all their forces in one spot and make a, a major attack against the city. Hours passed. Anxiety and fear overcame all the inhabitants because the Turks would have butchered them all. On the morning of August the 10th, the people observed something unusual for this time of year. I don't know how many of you have been in Greece in August. Listen to what happened. The sky was covered with black, thick black clouds as if a terrible storm was coming and it never rains, not in August. It wasn't long before a cataclysmic rain began to fall. The rain lasted all day. Because of this bad weather, no military action was taken that day by the Turks. The night was quiet. Just be before dawn of August 11th, a Greek patrol boat carrying out some reconnaissance found the Turkish trenches full of rain and many Turkish soldiers drowned in them. 
dead silence all over, rained everywhere. At dawn, the sun came out and the full catastrophe was revealed. There were a few Turks still alive. And they said that all night long, they saw Saint Spiridon accompanied by heavenly armies, scattering their navy and army. The island's unexpected salvation from the Turks also forced the Venetian governor to recognize Saint Spiridon as the savior of Kedkira. The governor and, and, and the governing authorities of the Venetian governing authorities of Kedkira wanted to show their gratitude to the saint. So they voted to, pl to place a vigil lamp, a silver vigil lamp, in his church. And they passed a resolution that the olive oil would be paid for by the government. And they proclaimed that August 11th would be a holy day and that the holy relics of Saint Smyrna would be taken in a procession throughout the city. This, this is still a holiday in Kerkira. August 11th is still a holiday, and the relics of St. Spiridon are taken out throughout the city. The Venetian governor of the island wanted to show his gratitude in a grandiose way. He wanted to impress the people. He decided to erect a papal altar, not a holy table, but altar, in the church so that mass could be said by papal clergy. This thought was greatly supported by the governor's spiritual father, who, who I think was a Dominican, who saw this as a great opportunity to impose papal innovations on the Orthodox of Kerkira. The governor called the priests of the church and announced his plans and asked for their consent. They, of course, refused and indicated that this, could be an, this would be an innovation and they should not be allowed. When the priest refused to consent to the placement of the altar, in the Church of St. Spiridon, but the governor decided to carry it out anyway, without their permission. The priest tearfully turned to their saint, prayed and asked for his help and protection. The governor, with the power which he had up to imprison the clergy, so nobody could stop him, and so he decided to carry out his desire. But the saint had other plans. The saint, Spiridon, appeared as a monk that night, two, no, two nights actually in a row, to the governor in his sleep, and advised him to give up his plan. Otherwise, he would regret it very bitterly. The governor was terrified, called his spiritual father, and repeated the saint's warnings. The spiritual father, the Dominican priest, laughed and pointed out that he, an educated governor, should not rely on dreams, which are the work of the devil, which are intended to interfere with and, di and disrupt a marvelous endeavor. <coughs> the words of the counselor calmed the fear of the governor, who on the next day, November 11th, 1718, set out for the Church of St. Spiridon to worship the relic and light his vigil lamp. This is what he said he was going to do, but actually he went there to measure the area where the altar will be built and determine the dimensions of the altar. There the priests once again tried to prevent him from carrying out his plan. They were not able to persuade him, but in a cruel and brutal way, he threatened to send them all, all the priests, to prison in Venice if they spoke to him again about this matter. The governor left the church with his entourage, he had decided that the next morning, that is on November the 12th, his workers would start the project. The priests and a number of believers stayed there, tearfully praying in front of the open rel uh, rel reliquary containing uh, the body of Saint, uh, Saint Spiridon. Saint Athanasius Pyrrhus has written this down. He was the historian who chronicled this. And he tells us that that day passed and at midnight, thunder and lightning shook the city. There was a guard at the entrance of the fortress near the army barracks. And he saw a monk walking with a, a handheld torch and entering the fortress where all the munitions were kept. 
He caught up to the monk and shouted, Who are you? Where are you going? What do you want to do? And a voice answered him, I'm Spiridon. At the same time, three flames came from the bell tower of the church. As an invisible hand grabbed the guard and threw him to the other side of the castle, the fortress. The guard fell, still standing up as if nothing had happened. He wasn't injured. At the same time, a loud, deafening explosion was heard, and the fortress was blown up with all the houses around it. The guard lived and was able to tell everybody what happened. The disaster was enormous. The governor was found dead outside the city wall. His spiritual counselor, the Dominican, was also found dead outside the wall, but in a ditch in which the sewers of the city were empty. The silver vigil lamp which the governor had given to the church of St. Spiridon fell and its base was damaged. This vigil lamp was again hung in the same place where it was before, and it still testifies until today to the disaster that happened. Far away in Venice, at the same time, a thunderbolt hit the governor's mansion, pierced the wall, and burned his portrait that was hanging there. The next day, after the event, the papal archbishop of Kerkira ordered all the material to be, that was to be used for the construction of the papal altar, he ordered it to be removed. Let's go on now next to Cyprus. That Cyprus was under papal yoke for about 400 years. The first intrusion was by Richard the Lionhearted in 1191. And so during the 400 years of papal rule in Cyprus, the papal church sought the annihilation of the other faith of the people of Cyprus. The Synod of the Franks held in Limassol in 1221 exemplifies the papal effort to destroy the power of the Orthodox Church of Cyprus. The Synod proclaimed that all newly elected clergy of the Orthodox Church would be obliged to swear allegiance to the Pope and to accept the faith. <coughs> this forced most of the bishops to go into exile. There were 14 bishops at that time, only four remained. One of the decisions prohibited the movement of both laity and clergy from their residence to other villages. They were not allowed to leave their homes because they were Orthodox. Besides the unbelievable taxes, also they were all made serfs, in other words, slaves, because the feudal system was set up in Cyprus where the Lord, the knight, uh, owned the village plus the people, plus the animals and the fields. And they had to work for the Lord. At that same time, the infamous, I don't know if you've read about it, heard about Papal Inquisition was instituted. And this allowed the examination of heretics using even what is known as the trial by ordeal, where innocence was proven by survival. So if you survive torture, if you survive drowning, if you survive being tossed into fire, you were innocent. And it, th this is the same method they use on the witches in, in Salem and other, where they would burn them at the stake and all that. That, that, was, that was actually a trial. It wasn't a punishment. They weren't being burnt to be punished. They were being burnt. That's how they were going to be tried. They, they came out of it alive. That meant that they were innocent. Now, we go to the fathers of Cantata. In 12228, Two monks from Asia Minor named John and Conan arrived on the island of Cyprus and established a monastic community in Mahera. From there they went to the monastery of Panagia Cantariotisa. And then afterwards they were joined by another nine fathers. The papal archbishop sent two of his representatives, inquisitors, to examine the fathers because these fathers had become well known throughout the whole island of Cyprus for their holiness. The fathers received the inquisitors in a friendly manner, and during the examination, the inquisition, the two inquisitors asked 13 questions about the Orthodox faith. 
And the fathers answered in a way where the Roman Catholic Dominicans, as they were, could find no fault. Then finally, they asked, what about using unleavened bread in the divine liturgy? Because that's what the papists were doing at that time. They instituted a new way of divine liturgy without leavened bread, but using unleavened bread, which today is what they call the host. The fathers responded, and I'm going to read from their response, because the minutes of their... Uh, of this have been recorded. We perform the divine liturgy as we have received from the Lord, the apostles and fathers of the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. Using leavened bread for the sacred mystery of divine communion. We do not know your present idea of using unleavened bread, for we have not received this practice neither from the preachers of Christ nor from the Holy and Ecumenical Synods. That is why those who carry out the sacred mysteries with unleavened bread diverge from the truth and misinterpret the scriptures. They continued their, their, their confession. The inquisitors became angry. And then the, the monks of Cantara suggested to the inquisitors, and this is a bit humorous, that they should perform two divine liturgies. One was to be performed with leavened bread by the Orthodox, and one was to be performed by, with unleavened bread by the, by the papists. And then the monk said that one of us will carry the Holy Communion into fire, and whoever comes out alive uh, is, is the innocent one. The one who burns is guilty. This is, this is, this is according to the so-called trial by ordeal, trial by fire. This was a valid way of finding out who's guilty and who's innocent. Burn them. If they die, they're, they're guilty. Of course, the Roman Catholic inquisitors didn't like that idea. So they said, no, 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 no. We have to go to the, the Archbishop uh, where we will bring up this matter again. The 11 fathers were then joined by two more fathers from the monastery of Machira. The 13 fathers together, 11 from, uh, from, uh, from the first Maori Cantara, and then two from Machera. The 11 fathers were joined by two fathers from the monastery. They appeared before the papal archbishop and repeated what they had said to the first inquisitors. The archbishop ordered them in prison, and in prison, the fathers were pushed violently, <coughs> beaten, stabbed with spears, and verbally abused. During the first year, from all this torture, St. Theognostos reposed. After he reposed, the, the rest were led again to, to another trial in front of the Archbishop. They again repeated exactly what they had said before. Then the Archbishop communicated all this to the Pope in Rome. And we have these documents on the 5th of March, signed letter, 1231, Pope Gregory IX, who knew that the monks were in prison, wrote to the Archbishop instructing him to proceed against them as if against heretics, invoking for this the secular arm against them, if you deem it expedient. In other words, turn them over to the civil authorities because they had a rule that the, the, the clergy themselves uh, could not execute a, a heretic, but they would have to be turned over uh, to the authorities. This is exactly what the Pharisees did to our Savior when they turned our Savior over to the uh, secular authorities, to Pontius Pilate. It's the exact same thing. Then the papists ordered that the fathers be tortured and killed. They removed all their clothing and left them naked. They tied their feet to horses and had the horses drag them naked on the sharp stones of the Pedios River. At the same time as they were being dragged by the horses, the Latins were stoning them and beating them with sticks. When the torment was over, their bodies were shattered. The saints, of course, had reposed. And they took their bodies and they burned them. The saint's memory is kept on May the 19th, the repose on May 19th, 1231. 
Most of the people remained Orthodox. There were, of course, many cases of Orthodox bishops, priests, and lay people who gave up their faith to secure a better earthly life. But most people listened to the words of St. Neophytus the Reclus. We have his icon here. We have his icon up in the Saint, in the, in the, in the, in the sanctuary. Many, many years ago, we, we talked about St. Neophytus, and we had an icon, somebody commissioned an icon uh, be made, and we have it upstairs in the church. We have St. Neophytus, who was the savior of this, the people of Cyprus. He was the main voice of the Orthodox faith at the beginning of this uh, papal yoke in Cyprus. St. Neophytus was a recluse. He closed himself up in a cave near Paphos. And he would send his admonitions against the papal yoke to all the churches in Cyprus where they were read by the priests or whoever could read to the people. We know of at least four homilies that dealt directly with papal heresy and innovation. You gotta re realize that only about one-fifth of the works of St. Neophytus have survived. And <coughs> reading these and the confession of the, the fathers of Cantara, the, the fathers of Cantara almost word for word repeat the words of St. Neophytus. He was a great saint. He's, he's the one who gave the Cyprian people their, their voice. What is sad is that the writings of St. Ne Neophytus have been hidden or lost, whatever you want to say, all these centuries. And scholars from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland are the ones who have published them, not the Cypriots. Because in Cyprus, even until today, there are many Cypriots who want to be Europeans and they want to whitewash this part of history. Now I'm just going to end, end this talk with just a few words of Saint Novitus. I'm, not, I'm reading from one of his things. The Crusader kings of Germany and England and almost all nations have moved to rescue Jerusalem and they have done nothing. Divine providence banished the dogs and replaced them with wolves. The Muslims were the dogs and the Crusaders are the wolves, worse than the, than the Muslims. And another place, St. Neotis writes, Now the situation in our country is worse, and the sea is under a terrible storm, and worse, because after a storm comes peace, while the storm here grows day by day, its wilderness has no end. Another one, clouds covered the sun, and hills and mountains of fog, and these deprived us of the warmth and radiance of the sun. Now, too, we have been covered with cloud and fog by the successive plagues that plague our country. I, I, I'll finish now. I could go on forever. There's just so much. But this is hopefully gives you a, an idea uh, of what happened uh, and how these are the saints that, unfortunately, have been hidden from us. Uh, I, I said at the banquet that I thank God that even the new calendar has been found in our parish. Uh, God has given me the ability to, to learn about all these saints that I had no idea of. Uh, anybody have any questions? By the way, we have some refreshments and something to drink afterwards. I, I can't see who's that. John. Stand up, I can't see who's that far. Uh, John Collins, okay, now I see. Uh, Loudly, please. Okay. Uh, I, I just Googled the history of Corfu, and they were under Napoleon for those years, and then the British for about 40 years before yeah. So what was, what, what was it like under Napoleon and, uh, and the British in Corfu? Because it was after the Venetians. Yeah. Uh, the situation remained about the same, but here's what, unfortunately, the Greeks slowly but surely started losing their faith and accepting uh, the Europeans. And that's why Europe and Greece was tickle pink and they still are uh, to be part of the European Union. And all these things that we mentioned before are not to be found in any of the school books. To the credit of the Cypriots, as I said, in the history, high school history of, the, uh, of Cyprus, they've got dedicated 43 pages of the textbook to just this period. But the Greeks have accepted all this stuff. In fact, up until when you go to Kerkin and now Kofu, 
up on the mountain there. It's a casino, but it was, it was a summer palace for the king of Italy. Uh, and many of the Greeks on these islands uh, are Roman Catholics, they're units. There are Roman Catholic churches uh, on, uh, for the Greek people on these islands. Now, in one island, I think Skiros, maybe half the population goes to the Roman Catholic Church. Not that the other half are much better because they're New Calendars <laughs> Greek. So, the, by the way, just the Acropolis that we see damaged on top of uh, the Parthenon and the Acropolis, up until recently, was intact. When the, when the Venetians had uh, taken over Athens, they poured, put all their ammunition in the Acropolis. And when, the ta and when the Turks attacked, they aimed their cannon towards the Acropolis. And that's why it blew up in, in the shape it is now, because uh, it, it was blown up because of all the Venetian munitions held in the Acropolis, which, before the Venetians came, was turned by the Christians into a church of the Theotokos. Uh, George. Father, how is the situation now with uh, the relationship with the Roman Catholics and the Greek Church? It seems that uh, there's, is it me or, it, like, they never really set a foot in, in, uh, in Greece as, as a church, like they didn't expand, they didn't take over orthodoxy, but they always have an influence. So well, the union movement never really grew in Greece, but didn't have to because the Greeks, by accepting the calendar and all the other renovations, uh, except the, the Pope of Rome, and, and actually now it's gone beyond the Pope. They've accepted uh, atheism. Uh, the churches now now turned into social centers and have really nothing to do with God. The liturgies and everything to do with it is just places for people to get together, and uh, the feasts such as Pascha and Holy Friday have turned into excuses to have a real good time. It's, it's the, the, the Greek people to the, you know, this is why when uh, we see our bishops uh, synod and, and now thanks to the internet, which has a lot of bad about it, but we can see the activities of our, of our churches in Greece and Metropolitan Moses. Uh, and his next talk, by the way, which will be in February, don't miss it, uh, will be on the making of the Holy Chrism in Greece with the synod and he'll have slides and then we'll talk about the mystery as a mystery but also the service of how it's prepared. Well, uh, our synod uh, and the parishes they have uh, is the only living uh, practice of the faith. And we see it. Otherwise, the majority of the New College Greeks have just become totally indifferent now. I sadly see it with my own relatives, you know. Like one of my nieces, very brilliant girl, her mother's a doctor, her father's a teacher, blah, blah, blah. They sent her off to England to study. She came back and oh, now all she posts on the internet is her global warming <laughs> things and they've lost the faith. It's all about the good life here on this earth. That's what it's all about. How to, have, how to maintain a good life. Get rid of the pollution, you know, save the turtles, hug the trees, keep them happy. You know. That's what it's all about now. <coughs> yeah, Dimitri. What books and resources did you use to read to uh, get, get all this information compiled? There, there's a lot, there's a lot. I just you wouldn't believe the hours I put in. Well, it's actually I've been doing this for years, right? Years and years ago, uh, Father David, Prison Dera. The rest of you were probably little kids. We're, we started talking about St. Neophytus, and that's why we have his icon upstairs. I had never heard about St. Neophytus until I met a few people in our parish from Cyprus with the names of Neophytus, and we have a lady named Neophyta. And I said, well, gee, who's this saint that's so popular among the spirits that I don't need, know anything about him? And I uh, started reading, and I was just St. Neophytus. Who, who, as I said, his works were put together by a committee at the University of Edinburgh, was illiterate. And he learned to read by the grace of God. He was illiterate. And by the grace of God, he learned to read. And today we have uh, his works in about a thousand pages, and they say that's maybe one, about one-fifth of what he's written. 
and he became the main voice of the Orthodox faith in Cyprus under the Latin yoke. And I remember when, when I first came, I who is Cyprus? Why do I have the names Saint Neopetus? And then I finally, I asked them, well, who is your saint? I <laughs> to say it. They didn't know who their saint was. They just knew he was a great saint in Cyprus, and everybody has the name Neopetus. And what's so funny is that the media wants to know about the resources. One of the resources was a podcast by the current Metropolitan of Paphos, whose name is Neophytus, and in his podcast, he's trying to justify the whole situation. So they, they, they have the saint, they have the icons, they take on the name, and then they go and do the exact opposite. And this is a, the current Metropolitan of Paphos today, his name is Neophytus. And you listen to his podcast, and he'll tell you, oh, oh, we're okay with the Europeans now. Back then they came and forced themselves on us, but now we go and willingly ask them to come to us inside. And just all this garbage. Talk about fake news, this is fake history, fake everything. By a bishop whose name is Neophytus. Okay, so what do you expect? Costa. Father, I, I just wanted to ask, did the Crusades do anything to, to slow down Islam or to, because... <laughs> they made Islam more violent. If, if ISIS exists today, it's because of the, the Crusaders. Do you know, when the Crusaders invaded and captured Jerusalem, they slaughtered everyone in the city. Does right? the have that idea that the Crusades were created sort of to fight Islam and to fight against Islam? That was the excuse. Yeah. And we just... Uh, Many reasons. One reason was to get them out of Europe where they were killing each other, were fighting constantly. I mean, Father Day will tell you some, I don't know, I don't know, how they invaded England. They killed every bishop except what, one? Yeah. And every abbot. Mm -hmm. And by the way, Father David is a Norman. So you can't be careful. His real name is not Bill, it's Bailden. <laughs> so we have a Norman amongst us. Yeah, there's that. Oh, yeah, yeah. Martyrs, says, says Peter the I mean, the persecution was, I mean, those, those Franciscans uh, in San, was it Franciscans who killed St. Peter the Anu in San Francisco? And that was unusual because of all the orders, the Franciscans were the friendliest towards the Orthodox, towards the Crusades. They sort of uh, many times sided like, against the Dominicans. I mean, don't, don't forget, the Roman Catholics were always fighting among themselves. And we said that when King Henry came down from Germany, they were there were three popes, uh, Italian popes, fighting among themselves, and it was really bad because they, they, and uh, it's, it's just so sad because the Church of Rome was the prime church in, of the of the of the epistles of Saint Paul. It was Saint Paul was there for three years. Saint Peter was martyred there. The early popes were all saints, and yet by the end, they were prostitutes running the papacy. So bad that the, the last pope they nicknamed him Pope Joanna, but it was Pope John. But he, he was run by, by his prostitute, who had a child by him and wanted to make him a pope. Uh, it's just so <laughs> The history of the papacy is, is just... And yet it's all been whitewashed. And yet the f documents are there. <coughs> the documents are there for everybody to find and read. And in fact, more and more documents are coming to light. They're just treated as archaeology. Is that it? We can have a coffee now. Get through the prayers of Holy Master Moses. Don't well, forget we February, Metropolitan Moses in English, Father Silas in Greek, on the Holy Mystery of Chrismation. <laughs>